75 people today. That was a good crowd. And yeah, thank you, Pastor Fred. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, but also it was a blessing to hear from Redeeming Zoe, uh, their story and, and to kind of hear, you know, what God's doing over in the Philippines. They've been there for uh, 10 months now, nine or 10 months, right? And, uh, so that was great. And then of course we baptized a young man today who feels led to go into the ministry, which is great and, uh, just a real blessing. Um, so uh, Mr. Kane told me that uh, we'll have, after tonight, we'll have two more weeks uh, of foundations, and then, uh, and then we'll discuss where we're going to go in the future. But one of the things that you guys can do to help us out is on Facebook, we put a, a survey, and it's all automated. You just go on there, and, and, and it's got several questions about this class and allows you to kind of share your thoughts uh, and your opinions about how we did this and how maybe we could improve it, you know, um, for the future, maybe a different night or, you know, cut the sessions in half or don't eat food or eat more food or, you know, um, I don't know, triple the length of the sessions, Erwin. How about that? And then just see who's left standing at the end. <laughs> yeah, rough, right, yeah. brightstar.church backslash now. You can do that on your smartphone. Uh, and then you can fill out the survey. It's at the bottom of the page, which is, you can always go to that every week because Pastor Brad's got that updated with all the announcements and all that fun stuff. So he works real hard on that. And we appreciate that, Pastor Brad. Thank you very much. Yes. You can also go to the app, right? It's not on the app, is it? The survey is not on the app. No, it's not. So we're working on the app, okay? The app is a work in process. <laughs> Okie doke. Y'all ready to dig into God's word? Okay. Well, I'm excited. What are we talking about this evening? Okay. Sanctification, obedience, it's going to be good. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Let's pray first, though. Are ready? Father, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for your word, and uh, we ask, Lord, that um, you would just open the eyes uh, of our revelation knowledge, Lord God, that just reveal the truth of Scripture to us this evening, and uh, open our hearts in a way that you never have before. Father, change us, transform us, allow us to be uh, moved by the truth of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Oh, I got You have one. You don't if, I, if you give me two, hey, yeah, does that mean it would be half as, half as long? Um, you know, the name of this, the series is called Fundam Fundamentals because it's, it's about the basics that we all ought to know or we all should be taught about um, redemption, about uh, our relationship with the Lord, about what Jesus did on the cross in his death, burial, and resurrection. And um, I know sometimes some of this stuff seems kind of deep, but it, you know, that's the thing about simplicity. The, the simplest things of God are profoundly deep. And once we really begin to understand those things, it just opens up our relationship with the Lord and helps, helps us to remember in every walk of life, it helps to remind us what our relationship really is with the Lord. And that's the idea of foundations is that we want to have such a sturdy foundation that it doesn't matter what life or what the devil throws at us, that, that our focus will always be on Jesus, knowing his faithfulness and delivering us through anything. One of my favorite clauses in the Bible is it came to pass. And that's what happens with things in our life. They come and they pass. But he remains in fact, he says, you know, Jesus is the word of God. He said, I, he is the word. And he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. I mean, that's how faithful the Lord is to us, that everything we see, everything we know can pass away, but his promises to us, who he is, simply won't. So you know, we're going we're gonna to deal with a, a, a number of topics tonight. We've got two more 
lessons and I, uh, sessions, and I, I just want you all to know how much I appreciate y'all coming and, and how much I appreciate your willingness to, well, to sit through what turns out to be a 50-minute or an hour class. I mean, not many people have the fortitude to be able to do that and still remain upright. Um, but I appreciate y'all coming, and I appreciate y'all's input. Um, so please do fill out those surveys. That's uh, input to us about how, what you think of the class, what it may have meant to you, and also how we can structure it in a way that uh, it might be a little bit more palatable for people who haven't been able to come, um, and maybe, even, maybe even in smaller segments. We don't know. We're waiting for your feedback, and we need to visit once we, once we get it. Well, the first topic we're going to talk about tonight is sanctification. And when you think of sanctification, this word sanctification, I mean, during your Christian life, you've heard words like justification, righteousness, sanctification, glorification, all those kind of ovations. And sometimes, I, I, one of the reasons that I wrote this down, started to research, researching this stuff, is I asked myself one time, do I understand what these terms mean to me as a Christian? And one of, the, one of these key terms is sanctification. What actually does sanctification mean, biblically speaking? In, under, the, under the new covenant, what does sanctification mean? And I think for many of us, the first thing that comes to mind is that, that, that we, we approach God having cleansed our own heart. We approach God with our good conduct. And we strive all through our Christian existence to improve ourselves so that we will be worthy to God. You know, this idea of sanctification to many of us is, is, is a self-improving effort, a self-improvement program. But the biblical idea of sanctification is something entirely different. So let's dig in and see what the Bible really says about it. Let's start with 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. It says, You know not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Or, I'm sorry, know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So on reading this, we start thinking, wow, that was, a pretty long, that was a pretty long laundry list. I mean, when he's using the term unrighteous, it's a term that, that means, um, it means unjust. And I think we'll remember from last week, we already know that we're justified before God, right? We are not the unjust. We are the just. We've been declared just in the eyes of a holy God because of what Jesus did for us, because of Jesus' blood. So if, if Paul is saying that this list, or the, the list of the unrighteous, but we're the righteous, then who's he talking about? Well, he says, you know, at the end of that, I mean, we read it in context, and such were some of you. Some of you did these kind of things, but you don't do them anymore. And you know why you don't do them anymore is because you have been redeemed, you have been bought with a price, and Jesus himself sanctifies us. He set us apart. Look, I mean, if we're just looking at this list of things, assuming there's anybody in this room that none of these things applied to in times past, there's certainly plenty of other things that would still toss us into the category of unrighteous if God had not already declared us to be righteous. I mean, what about, in addition to this list, what about uh, greed and, and criticism and uh, malice and gossip and gluttony and lying or just hating somebody in our heart? All of those things are sin. All of those things are unrighteous. And all of those things, without the, the gift of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, are worthy of the penalty of sin, which is death. Because in the eyes of God, the wages of sin is death. He didn't categorize. He didn't weigh. He didn't, he didn't put them on a continuum. He just said, knowing what to do and not do it, that's sin. That's it. And so even if this list that Paul gave doesn't apply to us, we know that we can't escape the kind of bad conduct that put us in a position that we were deserving only of death. 
the position of the unrighteous. So, I mean, and look, it, there's no question. God does not want us to engage in any of this kind of conduct. He knows it, it results in heartache, it results in heartbreak, and ultimately it results in death. God doesn't want us dead. He doesn't want us slaves to sin. He wants us to be free. I mean, how many times do you hear in this church, it is for freedom that Christ set us free? He wants us free. He wants us free in Him. He wants us un, unfettered by the weight of sin. And the only way we can be unfettered by the weight of sin is to understand what He did with sin. We've talked about that many times. But what we need to understand is if we equate sanctification with purity of conduct, it begs the question about whether man can be perfect in his conduct on his, in his own effort. I mean, if we really are saying sanctification means we purify our conduct, pray, tell me, how do we do that in ourselves? We can't. So just sanctification can't mean something that is impossible for us to do, or God wouldn't call us that. So what does he mean then when he talks about sanctification? Well, the word sanctify comes uh, from a Greek word, uh, hagazio. It means to consecrate or hallow. And a derivative of that word is hagiosmos, which is sanctification. It means purification or separated to God. In its, in its most summarized form, s- sanctification is set apart for God. It means something that's set aside only for the use of God. And when we, when we explore when this kind of thing happened, it started when the tabernacle was built by Moses. When God gave Moses the law, God told Moses to build a tabernacle that was used when they were wandering in the desert, and ultimately a temple was built that all the utensils and the, 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 the altar and and the show, table of showbread and the, and the, and the menorah and the, the Ark of the Covenant were housed in. But when it was the tabernacle, when Moses had it all built, then what did God do with all the items that were in that tabernacle? Well, God sanctified them. What he did was, when, when it was all finished, he had Moses anoint everything with oil. And oil, of course, typifies the Holy Spirit. See, they were, they were considered, these utensils and the priests were, were anointed by Moses with oil and set apart for God's purpose. That's what sanctification means. So in Exodus uh, 49, Aaron and his sons were dedicated and consecrated by Moses. Moses anointed them with oil. Moses sprinkled them with water. All of the utensils, the the, the, the ash pans and the forks and, 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 and everything in the temple that was in the tabernacle that was in the tabernacle was anointed by Moses and consecrated to God. When the Levitical priests were dedicated to the Lord, Moses sprinkled them with water. They then shaved their bodies, they washed their whole bodies and their clothes, and they were ceremonially clean. Moses sanctified them. So then how, I mean, if, if the idea of sanctification is that the high priest who Moses, Moses was the lawgiver, if, if the sanctification process by, to God because the lawgiver set these items and these people apart, and we understand that the Old Testament is a type and shadow of the New Testament, then how are we sanctified? Through the blood of Jesus. Blood of Jesus. And guess what? It, it wasn't... The high, it wasn't the, Le, the Levites and the priests that sanctified themselves. It was Moses that sanctified them. So when we think of sanctification, I don't know why we think that we can sanctify ourselves. We can't set ourselves apart from God. God chooses us, and he sets us apart for his use. Jesus prayed this. He said, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So in, when, when, John, when Jesus said this in John 17, 17, what he's saying is you are set apart by the truth. What's the truth? The truth is everything we've been learning over the last 12 lessons. 
who Jesus is, what He did for us in His death, burial, and resurrection, how He bought us with a price. He, he changed us from being enemies of God to being heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. He changed us from deser being deserving only of death to receiving all of the blessings of God, including inheritance. And then being called His very righteousness. Being called justified. And He sanctifies us. He sets us apart for His service. Isn't that what Peter said? Peter said, we're a... Um, we're a a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. God takes a sinner who believes Jesus and repents and accepts Jesus into their, their lives and converts them from a sinner to a royal priest. I mean, even in the lost time, you had the priesthood and you had the royalty. You had the priesthood, Aaron or his, or his descendants, and then you had the kings, starting with Saul, all the way to the last king. That was the royalty. What God has done is taken sinners and made them to be royal priests. We get all of it. That's what he's done through the, through the sanctification process. Here's what, here's what he said in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Christ, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, with the washing of the water of the word. That he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but, it, but that it should be holy and without blemish. What does this scripture say about who does the sanctifying? Christ loved us and gave himself for us that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word. So sanctification doesn't mean a self-improvement project, folks. Because if we are left on our own, we never can be good enough for God. We already know Isaiah said our righteousness, our best day of righteousness, is like filthy rags in the eyes of a holy God. So why do we still have it stuck in our head that we got to do something to improve ourselves? There's no good thing in the flesh. And guess what? They never will be. That's why we're going to get a new body. So when we start looking at that that way, we can, we can, we can get out of the mindset that we're, that we're, again, as I've mentioned so many times, this idea of self-improvement, this concept of sanctification based on us improving our condition is a self-righteousness that focuses us more on sin, who is the victor over us, than on Jesus, who is the victor over sin. But when we think about who we really are in Christ, we stay so focused on Him and we, such a, we have such an attitude of gratitude that we find ourselves not doing the things that we used to easily succumb to because we're not thinking about them anymore. We're thinking about how appreciative we are of what He's done in our life. I mean, do you understand that God Himself incarnated as a man and came and offered His very life and gave His very life for you? so that we could have this kind of relationship with Him. That is the most profound thing that you can imagine. I mean, if you carved Pinocchio, would you die for him? Would you die for Pinocchio? No. You would carve that nose right off his face, wouldn't you? And keep going. And every time he lied and his nose grew, you'd cut it off and reshape it, right? you get plastic surgery every time he lied. But would you die for him? No. Your very creator, your very maker died for you. And then he says, I give all of this to you. And now I've set you apart. I've taken you out of the world and I've set you apart for a purpose. My purpose. A purpose for me. So see, we get to praise God in truth. We get to praise Him for all the gifts that He's given us. We get to praise Him for who He is and what He's done for us. And we don't have to worry that we're going to be judged for our conduct. Is that a license to sin? No. You find yourself sinning less when you're focusing on Jesus. You find yourself sinning a whole lot more when you're focusing on sin. <clears throat> Don't ask me to explain the psychology of that. I just know that's how it works. 
But when we focus on Him, we get changed into His image by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what 2 Corinthians tells us. In fact, Jesus is our sanctification. He's the one that because of His offering of His blood, it gave, it gave the power to, for God to set us aside for His purpose. 1 Corinthians 1.30 I don't think I've got I don't think I gave that to Jeff. It says Jesus has been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. See, Jesus is our sanctification, it's not our conduct. And he wills to work his good pleasure in our lives by conforming us into his image. The, the problem with uh, the human version of sanctification, that's purity of living, it's it's not comprehensive enough. It doesn't go far enough. I mean, even those who don't do despicable deeds remain unrighteous and unsanctified in their hearts if they're not cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I mean, we, we can no more sanctify ourselves than the utensils in the tabernacle could sanctify themselves. You ever seen a spoon wash itself? I've seen plenty of times with our kids that I would have loved they had done that. But there was always a sink full of dishes when you had kids around. And you would just love for those dishes to wash themselves, wouldn't you? But they can't do it. Somebody has to sanctify them. Somebody has to cleanse them. Are we vessels? Or are we God? We don't have the ability to sanctify ourselves, folks. We don't have the ability to set ourselves apart. But God does. And His will to do that is stronger than our refusal to go along sometimes. That's how dedicated he is to that purpose. One of the problems, too, is even when we try to sanctify ourselves by conduct, we still have an evil conscience. We still have, we still have evilness in our, in our thinking. So that makes us have the appearance of holiness, but without a true and inner spiritual cleansing, we just ended up, we're really like the Pharisees. Jesus called them whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones. What was he saying? Man, you look shiny on the outside, but on the inside you're dead. Weren't we dead before we knew Christ? We're no longer dead. We're raised, born again, raised in a new life. We are dead on the inside. But when we try to sanctify ourselves... We're abandoning the truth that He sanctifies us and we walk away from His truth. And when we walk away from His truth, what it, what it results in our lives is self-righteousness. And that, that spawns all kinds of stuff. Judgment, comparing, lording over people, not having compassion. When we're self-righteous, it kind of gives us the attitude that, you know... I overcame that. You're struggling with it. You need to step up your game. There's not much compassion in that kind of thinking. But we realize that none of us have the ability to not be human. None of us have the ability and our own strength to quit sinning. It helps us to look at somebody that we see struggling, and instead of judging them through the eyes of self-righteousness, we have compassion on them through the mercy and the grace that God has shown us because of the things that we know we've done. In fact, the Hebrew author said this in Hebrews 10.22. We can draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You know, His blood sprinkles our conscience so that we won't have a bad conscience. St. John said this, he said, If your heart condemns you, He's greater than your heart. I think it's going to be next week we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And there's a fundamental question. I'll drop out there so you can think about it all week. Does the Holy Spirit convict Christians of sin? Now, we're not going to answer that tonight, but it's something I want you to ponder over the next week. But I'll give you this much in advance. Does your conscience remind you of when you sin? Your conscience is pretty good about it. Does the law tell you when you sin? The law is pretty good at that. I would not have known not to covet had the law said, don't covet. So you've got two pretty powerful forces there that are pointing out sin in our life. 
question is, is there the third and the most powerful force, the Holy Spirit, someone who does that also? But we'll answer that question next week. Now, Paul called the people in these conditions unrighteous. The question is, is he saying that anybody that did this are unrighteous? Did anybody that, that were uh, thieves and, and coveted and, and were drunk and revilers or extortioners, if they did it, does that mean, does that mean they were unrighteous? Yeah, it did. It, before they knew Christ. And after you know Christ, I mean, what, it, I think it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, for a Christian to live in a lifestyle like that. And that's what that means, is it's a lifestyle of that. People live in a lifestyle of that before they know God because the Holy Spirit is not there showing them a better way. Or if the Holy Spirit is there showing them a better way, they refuse to listen. They choose to live in that kind of lifestyle. That's the kind of people Paul's talking about here. I mean, what if after coming to know Christ, we succumb to covetousness? Covetousness. Does that make us unrighteous? I mean, is, is, is Jesus' imputation of righteousness that fickle? I mean, that kind of is tantamount to the idea that you can lose your salvation by doing some silly thing. How fickle is God? He's not very fickle. I mean, when He does something, it's done. Temptations, folks. Temptations to do things do not make us unrighteous. Temptations are brought along by the world, by our own lust and our own cares, and even by the devil to try to get us to stumble. God doesn't tempt us. God doesn't bring this stuff into our lives. God's not trying to make us fall off the rail. He calls us who we are. He wants us to see who we are. I am looking at princesses and, and princes in the kingdom of God when I look out and see you all. You can look in the mirror and say the same thing. You're a prince. You're a princess. And not just of the, a king, you are of the king. You are children of God. So much so <clears throat> that God sanctifies us to dwell in us. That's what God thinks of us. He wants to live inside of us. And for those who believe in Christ, He does. Just as the temple and everything in it was sanctified for the Lord's presence and use, so are we. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6.6, 6, For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Now, it's, it's pretty common and it's, it's pretty easy to say, and we've all heard that we've heard that the church is kind of the local gathering and that's, that's, that's the house of God, the building that we, that we worship in. And, you know, we, for those of us who understand that, we understand that that's not really what, that really isn't the, the house of God. The house of God is you. The house of God is me. That's right. You take the people out of this building, what you have left is a building. The church, folks, is us. Now listen to this. The, the, God had a little different perspective about his temple and about who, where he wants to live. Uh, the orig his original home was, when he left, when he decided to dwell among men, was between the cherubim above the Ark of the Covenant. And this is where the Ark of the Covenant dwelt. It was a magnificent structure, 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, 45 feet high. And according to a commentary from uh, 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 the Heart of Hebrew History, a book that I, that I have about Hebrew history, here's a little bit more particulars about it. It consisted of three general sections, the porch, the holy place, the holy of holies. The porch was 15 feet deep, 30 feet wide, 45 feet high. It contained two immense pillars, Jachin, which means durability, and Boaz, which means strength. The holy place was 30, 30 feet wide, 45 feet high, 60 feet long. It was made of hewn stone with cedar wainscoting, wainscoting and overlaid with gold. Imagine a building like that, big, overlaid with gold. This room contained the golden ark of incense, the table of showbread, and ten golden candlesticks. The holy of holies on the west end was a perfect cube, 30 feet in height, length, and width. 
It was separated from the holy place by a beautiful and expensive veil. It contained the ark and the huge cherubim. This room symbolized the presence of the holy God, Jehovah. It was to be entered only once each year, and that by the high priest who, after elaborate ablutions, entered on the Day of Atonement to atone for the sins of the people. Now, it wasn't the biggest building in the world, but it was immensely elegant and rich and gilded. David, not counting the precious metal that was donated by the, the, leader, the leaders of the people or the leaders of their tribes, which was a significant amount of gold and silver and bronze. David alone contributed this to build the temple. He contributed 4,000 4, tons of gold. 4,000 tons. 40,000 tons of silver and more bronze that could even be weighed. That was just what David contributed. It was the jewel of Israel, the house of the Lord. Now, I did a little quick check. I did a spot price of gold this week. And gold is fluctuating about $1,200 an ounce. In today's prices, the gold alone that was in the temple would be over $153 billion. The value of the silver that was in the temple would value over $18.3 billion. Just the silver and gold in the temple that David contributed. Not all the other precious metal, not the jewels, not the expensive artistry and artisan work that went in there, and not any of the gold or silver or precious metals that anybody else contributed. Just what David contributed total over $171 billion. It's the most expensive building that was ever built. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 16, 17, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. God left the most expensive townhouse in the world that was ever built and that will ever be built because he found in his wisdom a more luxurious place, our hearts. And that's where he dwells. Now, it must mean something to God to think that we're that precious to him that he would leave that to live in us. Don't you think it's time that we start thinking of ourselves that way? I mean, it's, e it's easy to judge other people to look at them and say, man, you got some work to do. It's easy to do that. That's not what God sees when he sees us. God sees his holy dwelling place. He sees that we're sanctified, justified, glorified. He sees, his, he sees the bride of Christ. That's what we are. But we need to understand that. Change your perspective about God, won't it? God considers us the holy of holies, the dwelling place of God. That, and by the way, the holy of holies was the room in the temple that was reserved for God and God alone. The priest could only enter once a year. God dwelled in there all by himself. It was holy, set completely apart, way above man. What must he think about us to want to live in our hearts? How holy has he made us that he says that's where he lives? I told you last week I thought for years that I knew Jesus wasn't coming back any moment because I could look around at the church and see that although he said that he was coming for a bride that was without spot or blemish or wrinkle. I saw spots and blemishes and wrinkles in the church. Until one day several years ago, the Holy Spirit nudged me and he said, don't call, what I, don't call unclean what I call clean. We are holy. The church is the most powerful force on earth because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And you've heard me say it, and you'll hear me say it again. When you walk into a room of strangers, every stranger in that room is blessed because you are there. We are 
we are little dynamos because of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so if sanctification is not self-improvement, then it begs another question. What then is obedience? What is obedience to God if it's not self-improvement? What does it mean to obey God? I mean, how many times have we heard that obedience... I, 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 we don't hear it in this church um, so often, but many times I can remember every other sermon, if not more often than that, I either heard obedience or obey somewhere in there. But very, very seldom did I get an explanation about exactly what I was supposed to be obeying. What exactly was I supposed to be doing? What did it really mean to obey God? I mean, so often we thought, well, we were commanded erroneously that our obligation was to keep the Ten Commandments. How many of y'all kept the Ten Commandments? How many have kept the Ten Commandments in your heart? See, that's, that's what we've often heard that obedience is to God. And it was left at that. And that's why that half the church is so guilt-ridden. is because they know, even though they haven't physically murdered somebody, they've wanted to. <laughs> well, you know what? Jesus said this. He said, I tell you, the law says that if you, if you kill somebody, you commit a murder. But I tell you, if you look at somebody with hate, you're in threat of judgment. The law says do not, if, if you, if, if, if you, if you um, sleep with your neighbor's spouse, then you commit adultery. But he said, I tell you, if you look at a woman and so much as lust, you have committed adultery in your heart. Jesus made it very clear the Ten Commandments wasn't about outward conduct. It was about the state of our heart. And then, you know, Paul made it very clear we can't keep the law. The law was intended as a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ so that we would understand what Christ did was to redeem us from the, the, ju the judgment of the law, the condemnation of the law, and set us free from the sin that so bound us up under the law. So what does it mean? Well, I was kind of thinking about this, and I started thinking about Samuel when he gave Saul, King Saul, the instructions to go and slaughter the Amalekites. Remember, the Amalekites were pretty mean to the Israelites when they were wandering around in the desert. They, the Amalekites t attacked them. And God had vowed that you know, he would later, when the, in the fullness of time, they were going to get their dues. So Saul, God told through Samuel, he told Saul to go and attack the Amalekites. And he said, I want you to kill everything. Every man, woman, boy, girl, sheep. Cow, goat, donkey, everything. Kill it all. Destroy it all. Well, they did that and they won. And Samuel came to talk to Saul. And Saul had, he had not killed the king. And he had saved the best of the livestock and best of the goods. The best of, he said, the, and, and, and Saul says, what is this bleeding in my ear? And Saul says, well, we kept all, kept all this for the sacrifices to God. That's why we kept it. I mean, the best of the spoils were kept, kept for a sacrifice to the Lord. But he gave no excuse why he didn't kill the king. Really, that seems quite noble, doesn't it? Hey, well, we'll take all the good stuff and we'll save it for God. Well, the problem was that's not what God told him to do. God just wanted him to obey. In fact, when, when King Saul told Samuel this, Samuel said, does, not, does the Lord have great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For the rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as the iniquity of idolatry. What's God saying? You don't get to decide what is acceptable in my sight. I do. You don't get to decide what is obedience to me. I do. And all I demand of you is to obey me. So if I say do something, all I expect you to do is do it. 
I value obedience more than I value you going through the efforts and the, ro- and, and, and the roteness of sacrificing. You think that this surface thing of sacrifice finds pleasure with me when I'm looking at your heart. And you didn't obey in your heart. And therefore, he, God removed Saul as king. He said, I will, I will raise up a king who is a man after my own heart. Who did he raise up? Who was the next king? David. King David. And what did God say of David? David was a man after God's heart. I don't think he meant David's heart was like the Lord's. I think what God meant was David was always chasing the heart of God. He always wanted to know God. He always wanted to have that relationship with God. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. That was David's attitude. So, I mean, has man changed much? How many times have we been talking, talking about it in these lessons? How man is constantly wanting to meet God on man's terms. It started with Adam and Eve when they met God with the fig leaves and went to the next generation when Cain offered the, the first fruit instead of the firstborn. It came all the way down to the Pharisees where they were thinking they were pleasing God because they were keeping the law. Jesus told him, he said, you'll tithe all your spices all the way down to your cumin, all the way down to your most minute spices, but you forsake the weight of your things of righteousness, love, and justice. That's why he called them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. They were all outward. It was nothing internal. Well, they really hadn't answered the question then about what we're to obey. I mean, what does it mean to obey God? So if obedience to God is not simply striving for what we think are good thoughts or deeds, then there must be something else. Well, the Greek word for obey is hupakou, hupakou. It means to listen attentively, to heed and conform. Now, that presupposes a command because if you don't have any command, there's nothing to heed to or nothing to conform to, right? So what exactly is, is, is God saying that we're to do to obey him? Well, Jesus answers that question a couple of different ways. One of them is in John 640. Jesus said, this is the will of the Father. Now, if he's saying this is the will of the Father, that goes to the heart of this question about how do we obey God? How do I obey? Well, this is His will. Okay, that's now going to tell me what I'm supposed to do to obey. Well, Jesus starts listing off off a bunch of do's and don'ts, right? No, He says this. This is the will of Him that sent me. That everyone which sees the Son and believes on Him may have everlasting life. And I will raise Him up at the last day. What is He saying is the obedience to the Father? The obedience to the Father is look to the Son and stay focused on the Son. And in Him, He will, he will be raised up at, in the last day. And in, in doing that, the person that does that will have everlasting life. That's it. Yeah, guys, it's not a bunch of do's and don'ts. We get hung up on that because that was, that's, that's who we know we are. God dealt with the do's and don'ts when he who knew no sin became sin so that we could be the righteousness of God. God has already dealt with the do's and don'ts and the consequences of it. He's more concerned about what he's made us to be. No righteous conduct, no proper words, no self-imposed penance to justify ourselves. No groveling, begging for one more chance, repetitive confessing before God, begging for His mercy. How much time have we wasted after sin imposing self-penance, not even being able to raise our face to heaven for a day or a week or a month? And God's saying, thank you that you finally decided to pray again. Now let's get on about the business of me having you set apart. You know, Jesus really was the perfect example of obedience. His whole focus 
was to do the will of the Father. I mean, he was sent to shed his innocent blood for our guilt so we could be reconciled to God. At any moment during that whole uh, passion, he could have called legions of angels and they would have come running to do his biddings. I, I wonder how hard it was for the angels just to keep their swords in their sheaths watching all that happening when they knew that any one of them could have taken all of Jesus' persecutors out. Wondering, what in the world was the Father up to? Did he go on vacation? How could they let these people do this to the Son of the living God? But God had a bigger plan. He offered His Son up, and it pleased Him to bruise Jesus so that we would not only be saved from the judgment of sin, but that we could live a whole, complete life healthy, prosperous life. Not only for the rest of the time that we were on the earth, but from here until the end of eternity. It's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? Because there is no end of eternity. You're living in eternity right now. Paul said this about what Jesus did in Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Jesus, who being in the form of God, though thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him a form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus was obedient to the Father. Jesus knew The Father wanted to use him as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world so that all creation could be reconciled back to God. Man broke it, man gave it away, and God had to go and redeem it. And in order to do that, he had to give his very life blood, and he did. That was Jesus' determination. He was obedient to do what God wanted. Well, I mean, if that, was, uh, Jesus, if that was the example, what are we supposed to do on such a grand scale to obey God? Right? Isn't that an example of doing? Well, that's our nature. It's our nature to think that codes of conduct and living right and bettering ourselves is the only way to please God. What we don't remember is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul said this in Romans 3.11. He said, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. I think if God gave us the command, some of us, to do some action, it would be, we, would, we would stumble along the way. We're not made to be perfect in ourselves. We're only made to be instruments of God's use. And really, if you stop and think about it, I mean, if we had the ability to earn our own righteousness, Jesus didn't need to die. And that would make God a despot. A tyrant. But God loves us enough He didn't want to be separated from us. So he, he went through this entire process of sending His own Son to shed His innocent blood to pay for the sins of the guilty, to go through His brutalization, and then rising from the dead because since sin is the wages of death, de- the wages of sin is death, and Jesus never sinned, death had no power over Jesus and couldn't hold Him dead, couldn't keep Him dead. That's why He resurrected And everything that Jesus did, even though he didn't deserve it, he did it on our behalf and gave it to us. And therefore, now God looks at us and says, you're righteous, you're justified, you're holy, and you're sanctified. I set you apart because of what my son did for you. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 1.17 says, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Faith in what? Faith in exactly what Jesus did and what he did to declare to us who we are and what we are in him. Faith in that. Because that's unbelievable. You mean we're really that? That's exactly what I mean. And it takes faith to believe that because it's just unbelievable to think that God would do that for somebody like me and you. In his commentaries on uh, this verse in particular, Matthew Henry observed that faith is all in all, both in the beginning and progress of Christian life. It is not from faith to works, 
as if faith puts us into a justified state and then works keeps us there. But it is all along from faith to faith. It is faith pressing forward and gaining the victory over unbelief. That is what Christian maturity is all about, folks, is living from faith to faith and faith at all points in between. It's not starting with faith and then somehow becoming a super spiritual Christian and we got this, God. We don't need to believe you anymore. We got this. That's not what it's about. I mean, that's what happened to the Galatians and and Paul scolded them pretty harshly. He said said in Galatians 3, he said, you foolish... Well, here's what happened. They started with the gospel... And then they thought that they would maintain their relationship with God by going back into keeping the law. And Paul didn't pull any punches with them in in Galatians 3. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? He said that for you to go back and thinking that you can maintain righteousness before God by keeping the law is that you have a mind that is clouded and bewitched. You are delusional. Who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? Or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Paul couldn't believe it. You heard You heard the gospel, you believed by faith, you accepted Christ by faith, and now you're trying to maintain that status of righteousness by your own works? You were already living under the law. You were already living under the law. Man, you you couldn't find a connection with God outside of the gospel. Why are you now going back outside the gospel? The Galatians had fallen into works prescribed in the law after receiving the truth through faith faith in Christ. This believing in what you heard is faith in the gospel. Faith in what we were commanded. And here's something else that Jesus commanded. Jesus uh, in John 13, 34 said, A new command I give you. What did Jesus tell his disciples was the greatest commandment? When they asked him. When they asked him, he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, and love your neighbors as yourself, right? How in the world could we do that? I mean, this was before Jesus' crucifixion, so they were still living under the law. If love does not originate with us, if God is love and God originates with Him, then how in the world can we keep a command like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength? How could we do that of ourselves? Jesus understood that, and this is why He said this, a new command I give you. Love one another. How in the world do you do that? As I have loved you. That's how you do it. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. What did Jesus do for us? Everything. We bring nothing to the table. And because of that incredible love that he showed us by doing what he did for us, We now understand what it means to love because we receive that love and we're able to reflect it back to Him and radiate it to others. So when we're focused on Jesus, the Holy Spirit changes us and we find that we look at people that in times past we might have judged, we might have hated, we might have had very harsh feelings for because of the things they did or the things they said or the things they did or said to us. And now we're able to look at them with compassion the compassion of God, and say, I know what you're doing is hurting people. But what we begin to see is we realize they're hurting on the inside. And that gives us compassion because we have the very hope that they need and we want to give it to them. That's what love does for us. That's how love teaches us to love each other. I love that scripture in 2 Corinthians 3, 18. You know, we with unveiled faces behold 
God as if through a glass and we're changed into his image from glory to glory by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we're focused on Jesus, he changes us into his image. That's, that is, if anything, the sanctification process. If we're going to change, he's the one that does it. Not us. Thank goodness. If you want to know how good you can change yourself, just look at how you would change somebody else. <laughs> We don't want people to be in our image, folks. I mean, I can't think of the number of times lately where I'm thinking, man, I need a clone. I'm so busy. And then I realize, if I had a clone, I'd be in an argument with myself all the time. <laughs> I don't want to create somebody in my image. <laughs> Look, simply put, obedience to God is a belief in Jesus, what he did, and in so doing, to allow that love to be shed abroad in our heart so that we can share it with others. That's what obedience to God is. Staying focused on Jesus. Letting Him change us. Letting, us love, letting Him love others through us. That ought to keep us busy, don't you think? And, and guess what? It's plenty to keep us busy for the rest of our life. So if we're going to be burdened by something, let's just be burdened by love. That's pretty easy called rest, which we'll talk about next week. So if this whole concept of obedience has nothing to do with works, then what does the Bible tell us about works? How many times have you heard a story about like this? My name is Sally. I love church. I attend every Sunday morning, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, any other time the doors are open. If they had a revival or a guest speaker, I was there. If the church sponsored a conference, I'd throw in and attend. I passed out tracts to my neighbors. I'd go on a mission trip every year. I wanted to do whatever the pastor said I needed to do in order to show my devotion to God. I wanted to love God more, so I started helping with, with uh, vacation Bible school and church camp. Some women in the church started a woman's Bible study on Saturday morning. I didn't want to miss that. I helped in the nursery, the food pantry, clothes distribution, and drove the church bus. When I was out in the community or at work, I was keen to spot any opportunity I had to, quote, lead someone to the Lord, close quote. I was really working hard for the Lord, yet I did not feel closer to Him. I grew tired and frustrated. Why was my relationship with God not growing given all that I was doing for Him? I felt completely burned out and angry toward God. I love God, but I didn't want to do those things anymore. What do you think happened to kill, Sally, kill Sally's passion for service. She wasn't really doing her job. You know, we exhaust ourselves sometimes in what we call service for God. We burn ourselves completely out, down to the quick. But see, folks, that doesn't deepen our relationship with the Lord. In fact, if anything, sometimes it drives us away. Jesus addressed this problem in Luke 10, 38, 42. The background is that Jesus and his entourage were attended Mary and Martha's house. And Mary and Martha were sisters. And, you know, in that culture, when you had somebody come over, you know, you made them feel welcome. You washed their feet. You made them food. You did everything they needed. I mean, it, it's a very, very social community. And it's really a social taboo to not make somebody who is a guest in your home feel welcome. Now, Jesus had 12 disciples, and by, some, and by many accounts, there were still another 120 following around too. Now, I don't know how many people were over there that day, but I'm pretty sure most of the disciples were. So you had Mary and Martha and Jesus and 12 disciples. You had 15 people in what was probably not a very big house that two sisters lived in. So Mary's running around. She's doing everything. She's running frantic. And you know what What happens? Martha, her sister, the lazy bones, she's sitting there listening to Jesus. Martha says that about Mary. Did I say it backwards? Yeah. Martha's saying that about Mary. And Mary's just sitting there and she's just absorbed. She's, in, she's enchanted by what Jesus is saying. 
And finally, Martha just can't stand it anymore. And she goes to Jesus and said, Lord, make her help me. Look at her. She's just sitting there listening to you. No. Jesus says this. Actually, Martha says this. She said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? I mean, really, that's kind of rude, isn't it? Then tell her to help me. Make her help me. Deadbeat. I mean, come on. Here's what Jesus said about that. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. See, Jesus wasn't there to eat her cornbread. Jesus wasn't there to see the decor in her house. Jesus wasn't there for that purpose. Jesus was there to share with them the truths about the kingdom of God. And Mary was sucking it in, and Martha couldn't stand it because she thought that the way you pleased the Lord was to do all this running around and all this stuff for Him. You know, she probably was a good cook. The house probably was nice. Jesus didn't care about that. He wanted, he wanted His disciples to hear the truth. How many times did Jesus say this to people? You know, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Remember he said that to the lady at the, the Samaritan lady at the well. Or in John 4, 32, he says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Jesus was more focused on us understanding the relationship that he wanted to have with us than what we could do for him. I mean, honestly, folks, can you think of anything that God needs us to do that he can't do himself? I mean, if, if, you, if you died tonight, would there be a big hole in history? Would the, would the, would the universe come screeching to a halt? <laughs> God doesn't need us. We need Him. Amen. But God wants us to believe Him, and that pleases Him. Right? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Right. Well, then the flip side of that must be true. Faith pleases God. Faith in what? Faith in all these promises we keep talking about. Isn't that liberating? No wonder he says it's for freedom that Christ set us free. When we start looking at it that way, he's not interested in all these do's and don'ts. Now look, don't, everybody don't stop doing what you're doing and have Mike call me and say, listen, we're going to have to back off on some of this because there's nobody doing anything around here. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> what I'm saying is that when we start returning to our first love and we allow his love to just flood our souls on a daily basis, one wave after another of his love crashing on us, we will be so inspired to do things that, that, that Michael will go, well, I'm just going to have to put you on a waiting list because I don't have anything else to be done around here. Everybody's waiting in line to get something done. That's what inspiration does. We don't do out of duty. We don't do out of fear of judgment, or thought of reward, we do because we want to because of His love in our hearts. It's called inspiration. Well, so that leads to, the, I guess, the, the final point tonight, and that is, well, if we're not doing for this concept of reward, then what does reward mean? We can pack up and go home because you hit the nail on the head. But you know, there's a, th there's a doctrine around, and it's a very common doctrine, that we work for rewards in heaven. If you look through the New Testament, any time that 
there is a discussion about what God does for man, the term rewards, the plural, isn't used. The term reward is used. When you're talking about what man does for man, then you use the plural rewards. So the question is, you know, do we have rewards? Interesting question. Do we have rewards? Now Jesus referenced in both Matthew 5, uh, 12 and Luke 6, 3 that those who are persecuted for righteousness sake have their reward in heaven. So he talks about reward. Now the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said when a person prays openly to be seen and heard, he has his reward. But the one who prays in secret, God will reward him openly. God will reward him. Jesus tells us that if we receive a prophet, we will receive a prophet's reward. And if we receive a righteous man, we will receive a righteous man's reward. So make no doubt about it. God rewards us. But the question is, what is the nature of that reward? He says every man will be re- rewarded according to his works. Jesus said, whosoever gives a cup of water to someone in his name shall not lose his reward. St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.4, that the one who waters and the one who plants is nothing, but each receives a reward for their labor. Reward from heaven, though, is always singular. Now, I was kind of drawn to the message of the churches in Asia in uh, the first couple of chapters of Revelation because there the angel of the Lord the Lord is speaking to John and he says these are the message for the seven churches and he starts talking about rewards. When we think of rewards, you know, I think sometimes this concept of rewards, we, you know, storing up riches in heaven and what we do, God's going to reward us for it's almost like this concept of, you know, I'm going to have a I'm going to have a corner penthouse in the kingdom of heaven in God's mansion. I'm going to be five stories above you. Or I'm not going to be on an outlying thing. I'm going to have a good view of everything. It's going to be one of the nicer apartments. I think that's kind of what we think sometimes when we think of rewards. Look how God thinks about rewards when he's talking to the churches. He basically, Paul 7, he says, for those who who persevere, those who, who stay faithful to the end. Faithful in what? Believing his promises to the very end. These are the kind of rewards he says he'll give. The right to treat, to eat from the tree of life. Well, you know what? Who is life? Who's the bread of life? So we've kind of already had that blessing, haven't we? Won't taste the second death. Or how about this? A white stone with a personalized name from God. Power over the nations to rule with a rod of iron. The morning star, white raiment, that their names not be blotted out of the book of life, that their names are confessed before the Father and angels, that they're made a pillar in the temple of God, that they be written on with a new name, an opportunity to dine with the Lord. What does every one of these have in common? The reward itself is some way associated with him, with a relationship with him. On further in the book of Revelations, there are 24 elders around the throne with crowns. Now, I don't know who those elders are, but man, you must have had done something pretty impressive to get a crown and be called a one of 24 elders around the throne of God? Know anybody on your, on your Christmas list that you think might fit that category? Not what does it take? I mean, you'd think that's pretty important. I would say that a crown on the head of an elder around the throat of a God is a pretty significant gift. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what happened? When the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world stood up among the midst... You know what the elders did with those really impressive, really expensive, really high-end, really unique, really rare crowns? They threw them at his feet. They threw them at his feet. Because you know what they realized? 
they were meaningless without Jesus. I think sometimes we get caught up in rewards because it's our human think. And it's fed by the Protestant work ethic. We work, we get. We don't work, we don't get. You earn what you get. You go and make yourself a self-made man, self-made woman. And so we have this concept that if we go, you know, if we work, and we do need to work, and, you know, we do receive when we work. That, but that's not the point. Sometimes we get carried away with that, and our, our, our thinking falls off the rails. You know what? I don't know what heaven's going to be like, but I know why it's heaven, and that is because he's going to be there. And believe me, it won't be heaven if he's not. That's what makes hell hell, by the way. It's not that it's a particularly bad place. It's a horrible place. But what makes it particularly hellish is that God is not there. There's no goodness there. I think we need to think like God told Abraham. He said, Abraham, I am your exceeding great reward. Folks, if we have Jesus, we don't need anything else. And didn't Jesus tell us that? He said, seek first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. I think when we're thinking about all these other things, we got the cart before the horse and it takes our focus off of Jesus. I think that's what happened to the church at Ephesus. Remember, that was the very first church Jesus spoke to. He said, listen, man, you guys are you guys are diligent. You test those who say they're apostles and are not. You're faithful in everything. What church wouldn't want to hear that? I mean, you would think if God started out saying that, God's going, all right, guys, you're doing great. Until he says, but I have this one thing against you. You've left your first love. Now, when you read in the book of Acts, when Paul went to Ephesus, he made it very clear that he preached the gospel of grace. That was the first message they heard. And that gospel set them free. They fell in love with Jesus because of the love that he poured out on them. They started out loving Jesus. And they ended up in this warning at the time that Jesus gave John this revelation that they were so focused on their works and their rewards that they completely took their eyes off of Jesus. He said, listen, you need to re repent, remember, and return. Repent of what? Repent of turning, turning their back on God, thinking that just like the Pharisees, it was their works that were pleasing Him. Remember what? Remember your first love. And then what? Well, once we think about it, then we have to do it. If we're going to remember it, He wants us to come back. Repent, remember, and return. And if you don't, I'll take away your candlestick. The candlestick is the anointing on the church. Now, Ephesus was probably, in, at that moment, the premier church in Christendom. I mean, it was founded by Paul, Priscilla, and Aquila probably taught there. Apollos probably blew through and, and taught there. Timothy was its first bishop. St. John was its second bishop. I mean, if you were anything in Christendom, Ephesus was where it was happening. Guess where the church at Ephesus is today? It is a ruin. It wasn't that the threat of God was fulfilled. It, it is that when we take our eyes off Jesus, it's like flicking the power off. All the power left and the church died. Why? If you're not focused on Jesus, you don't have any power in your life. This church quit focus, quits focusing on Jesus. It'll be just like every other dead assembly. People will come thinking they're going through motions of worshiping God and Jesus never gets lifted up. But when we keep focusing on Jesus and keep raising His name up, guess what? He said, if, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. So it's a simple solution, guys. It's not about works. Obedience to God is believing in His promises. And that promise is, look to the Son, and in Him you will have eternal life, and I will raise you up in the last day. That's what that is. Isn't that simple? What's rule one? It's 
It's all about Jesus. What's rule two? See rule one. It's all about Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word, and thank you for opening our hearts to hear your word and our minds to understand. And thank you that we know that this is only revealed by your Holy Spirit, and so we're so grateful and we're so humbled by the fact that you love us enough that you want us to know this truth. So help us to understand that we are sanctified. It's nothing we do. It's about what you did. That rewards mean nothing if it's not you. And the obedience is coming to you and believing your promises. Help us to never forget that. Ground us in our faith, Father. That's why we're doing foundations, is that we'll be grounded in our faith. Let this week be a week where we see our faith soar because we're focused on Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.